we will start in just a little bit. So if you can um, find a place, we still have people coming in. And um, so, but we will start in just a little bit. You want to say something? I would just say give it a minute or two. We'll start in about two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr. I'm a member of the Department of Urban and Regional Planning and the School of Architecture and Planning, director of the UB Center for Urban Studies, and associate director of the UB Community Health Equity Research Institute. With great humility and a sense of urgency, I welcome you to this 514 Remembrance event. Racism, racial literacy, and mental health, a conversation with Dr. Howard Stevenson. This vital conversation is sponsored by the Jacob School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, the School of Social Work, the Graduate School of Education, and the Office of Inclusive Excellence and the Community Health Equity Research Institute. The event was purposely scheduled on the eve of last year's murder of 10 black people who were killed in a racially motivated shooting at Topps Supermarket on Jefferson Avenue. We hold this conversation to remember them, the hideous act that took the lie, their lives, 
and to forge a path toward healing, social justice, and the building of an anti-racist society. We also want to remember and deepen our understanding of the great harm done to black people by quiet racism. Those hidden, viral, and toxic forms of racism that quietly operate within and across structures, institutions, and systems to harm and traumatize African Americans. Reflecting on that hot summer day when a white racist came to Buffalo to kill black people, we rightfully focus on loud white supremacy and think of ways to rid the nation of its harmful, scornful face. Without question, we should pursue every avenue to abolish our white supremacy in the United States. At the same time, we must never forget its evil twin, quiet white supremacy. Racial hatred, I contend, has both a scornful face and a quiet smiling one. While both will do harm, quiet white supremacy is particularly traumatizing to African Americans. For example, the endless stresses that negatively impact black people are produced by their quest to make ends meet, paying exorbitant rents for substandard housing, fearing violence from the police and their own people, or simply navigating and negotiating omnipresent inequities and social injustices and inequities. When historical trauma, which can be passed from one generation to the other, are added to the equation, we can begin to appreciate how the cumulative effects of white quiet racism can lead to anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges among African-Americans. So once again, I welcome you to this conversation on racism, racial literacy, and mental health. And at this time, I invite Dr. LeGarrett King, Associate Professor of the Graduate School in Education and Director of UB's K through 12 Black History and Racial Literacy Program to take the floor and he will introduce our guests. Dr. King. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, I appreciate that. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Howard Stevenson. Dr. Stevenson is the Constant Clayton Professor of Urban Education Professor of Africana Studies in the Human Development and Quantitative Methods Division of the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. He is also the Executive Director of the Racial Empowerment Collaborative, a research pro um, program development and training center that brings together community leaders, researchers, families, and youth to promote racial literacy and health in schools, neighborhoods, and organizations. He authored Promoting Racial Literacy in Schools, Differences that Make, um, that make a Difference, a provocative book um, and require reading for my graduate students that explores how schools and places where racial conflict often remain hidden at the expense of a healthy school climate and the well-being of students of color. In 2021, Dr. Stevenson was elected to, to membership in the National Academy of Education from 2020 to 2023, he has been listed in the Rick Hayes Straight Up Ed Scholar Public Influence Rankings of the top university-based scholars in the United States who did the most to shape educational practice and policy. Among psychology scholars on that list, he was ranked number 11 in the country. Dr. Stevenson is a tireless advocate for racial literacy. We are so grateful that he's able to be with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stevenson.
Thank you, Dr. King, Dr. Taylor. Um, folks, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. And um, on this very important occasion, I share my prayers with you for those of you who've lost in the pain. And I'd like to talk about um, the concept, if I could get the uh, screen, one second, on um, healing first um, in the face of racial hate. Um, and my hope is um, to share a little bit about our work, but also I look forward to the panel discussion and questions later. When I uh, first came to the University of Pennsylvania, or before, let me see, I don't think I'm hitting this right. I gotta stay back here. Okay. Okay. Before I came to the University of Pennsylvania, I, uh, as a clinical psychologist, was running residential treatment centers for sexually abused youth and families. And as much as I see myself as a therapist, I also see myself as a scientist. And I'm an old school family therapist, got my training in the Child Philadelphia Child Guidance Clinic. And I loved the work that I was doing, but I was also interested in the research question, which is basically, how do families protect their children from racial hostility? How do they heal from racial hostility? And as much as I tried to be that kind of clinical leader that could do science, I did try to write while I was working 60 hour weeks, but it wasn't enough. Finally, I got an offer to come to Penn as a visiting professor and I was excited, I had dreams. I had dreams that I'd finally get the opportunity to answer the questions that I was interested in. I felt excited. I continued to do my clinical work, but I had dreams that I finally would get colleagues who would help me write. I had dreams that I would read their work, they would read my work, that we would hold hands and skip into the sunset of academic nirvana. I had dreams. I also knew that uh, my colleagues might be a little scared about my topic around which we call the talk or racial socialization and also my physical presence because a lot of places I've gone, my very physical presence has scared people just while I'm walking down the street. So I decided very early on in my first year that I was gonna be the kind and gentle colleague, the one that would win the Professor of Congeniality Award by the end of my first year. There was no such thing as a Professor of Congeniality Award but I was gonna win it if there was. And my, my strategy was that I was gonna shape shift myself ever so slightly in order to make my colleagues feel less threatened. I decided that I would do everything possible to make myself kind and gentle. Now, as, after a year had passed, as much as I wanted to, we did not get to go out to the coffee houses around Penn or get to read each other's work. I read my colleagues' work, but they did not read mine. And there was no holding hands. There was no looking into each other's eyes. There was no skipping. And after the first year, I was disillusioned. And I said to myself, I'm not sure I want to come back. And I started thumbing through um, the newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer in a magazine insert. And I saw these images that seemed eerily familiar to me as if I should read on because you know how magazines help us figure out our future in our dis disillusioned lives. And I decided to read on. And in the first paragraph of this article called Another Country, it says it's out there somewhere between the corporate capital of Wilmington and the neon brightness of Delaware's recreational shore. Out there somewhere after the byways scatter and the pavement goes to dirt is a place deep within poverty and at the edge of hope. Well, I was intrigued because I grew up in Southern Delaware, between Milton and Georgetown, basically the woods, the country. So I wanted to know where is this place that this, these authors are talking about? And then I got pissed, I got angry because I could not understand how this newspaper could misspell Delaware. I said, how in the world could this Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper misspell the state that I grew up in, but I didn't, let it deter me. I kept on, even though I was pissed, I kept on and I came across an image 
of Billy Johnson. After a day picking potatoes, Billy Johnson takes a rest in a migrant workers camp. And as soon as I read migrant workers camp, an image triggered in my mind about a migrant workers camp that was about three miles from where we grew up in a town called Slaughter Neck. And I can still see in my mind's eye the rusted tin roof houses and the gated community that we used to pass by on our way up to Northern Delaware. And then I triggered on another image of Jose Santiago. Jose Santiago was my best friend in first and second grade. And the one thing I can tell you about Jose is that he was the biggest and largest person in the first and second grade. I did not know how old Jose was. I did not care how old Jose was, but we used to get, we became friends because we got called racial slurs and we'd have to take it out into the schoolyard. And whenever we had a fight, whenever Jose was around, we kicked butt. We never lost a fight because Jose was huge. But sometimes Jose would be gone for months at a time and then it would be the opposite outcome. I'd get my butt kicked until my mother would push my four-year-old brother Ryan's butt over the Milton Elementary School wall and try to help me out, but it wasn't the same because Jose was huge. My parents told me that Jose was a member of a migrant workers family, which meant they had to go down south to pick crops. That's why he wasn't there. I triggered on an image when I was seeing Billy Johnson. And then I came across Lakeisha Burton and Cassandra. And I came across the 76 year old woman named Miles Edith. And before I knew it, I saw that they, they lived in Milton, Delaware. And then it hit me all of a sudden that these folks are talking about my neighborhood. They're talking about my people. And I got upset. I got angry. I could feel it in my gut. I was so upset because they're talking about my people as if they don't have any hope. This is not how we would describe my community, my people, this narrative, this story about somehow we belong or come from another country. This bothered me. These people helped to raise us. They helped to keep us alive. No, we did not have a lot of money, but we definitely had a whole lot of hope. This bothered me. So when I came back to Penn my second year in 1991, I've been there 30 some years, I said to myself, I belong at the University of Pennsylvania, but I do not fit in. You ever belong someplace, but still not fit in? I defined belonging to the question of, do I accept myself? Do I accept my difference, my competence, my people, my culture, my style, my language? The answer was yes, I do. I can do clinical psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, even if I have to do it all by myself. I can do that. Whereas I defined fitting in to the question of, do I want to depend on others' definition of my culture, my competence, my language, my style, my attitude? And the answer is no, especially if shape-shifting is a primary coping strategy that I have to do to try to get my, my colleagues to feel safe. First of all, it didn't work. No matter how much I shape-shifted, it, it didn't get my colleagues out of their rooms to go to those coffee houses to co-write or to share. And two, it's kind of grandiose of me to think that I can somehow, through dent of will, through movement, through shape-shifting, that I could somehow change the racial fear of another person. How grandiose is that? Absurd, if you think about it. Now, I don't know how many of you know about code switching. Anybody know about code switching? Code switching comes out of the field of linguistics, tends to be around how people try to fit in by changing their language, changing their way of speaking and talk. I like shape-shifting better because it comes out of the field of Star Trek Next Generation. Anybody heard of Star Trek Next Generation? Okay. First year, not the 10th year, uh, there was a race of aliens, shape-shifters, who had this ability to become entirely different people. And when I think about the psychology of racism and its effect on folks who are different, it changes more than your language. It changes more than your words. It changes your very being, your very presence, your sense of self, your dream, your identity, your personality. It's much more holistic and whole body. And so I 
So I changed my idea about how I was gonna be at the University of Pennsylvania. And I came across this African proverb that we still use today. The lion story will never be known as long as a hunter is the one to tell it. And what I mean by that is everybody's story, racial story is important. And everybody has a racial story that's important and powerful. My racial story is not better than yours. And your story is not better than mine. But there is a caveat, and that caveat is, is that if you don't know your racial story, then you're gonna lose out on understanding the power of what it means to take your story in the world as it is true. Because if you don't have a narrative about your story, about your racial experience, somebody else will write one for you. Does that make sense? So part of our work, we run a, I run a nonprofit called The Lion Story. You can look it up on thelionstory.org. We do trainings for about 2,000 folks, including police officers, educators, young people, a year. And part of that process is everybody has to practice working on their story to address the stress and trauma in their lives. The strategy I share with you in discussing my, my uh, upbringing in Southern Delaware was also the same strategy that we try to teach young people as young as third grade. Calculate, locate, communicate, breathe, and exhale. You cannot heal if you don't know that you're in pain, if you don't notice what impact rejection has on your body, your heart, your mind, and your soul. Calculate means what feelings am I having in the moment and how intense are they? Locate is where in my body do I feel it and be specific. And communicate is what do I say to myself doing the racial harm, doing that incident of rejection and what images or memories come to mind? And then the idea of breathing and exhaling is absolutely essential to help bring oxygen to our brain because when we are scared to death and when we've been assaulted or when we are fearful that we might be assaulted because of our difference, our brains can go on lockdown. We could be on a, on a scale of one to 10, eight, nine, 10 is like panic, fight, flight, or fright. And so breathing in slowly, four counts, holding it for four counts slowly, and letting it go four counts even slower, we get a chance to open up our peripheral vision because when we are scared to death, we lose peripheral vision and hearing. We don't see to the left or right and oxygen helps open that up. So I'm gonna come back to this, but I'm still focusing on the notion of how do we heal first before we fight? For all of our trainers, we have over 30 trainers from every identity spectrum you can imagine. And each one of them has a different racial story and they have to work on that story before they speak to an audience. And it's, it's good work, it's powerful work. This is my story, my family. I grew up in a multicultural family and we expect people to bring photographs, by the way, of whoever they define as family. This is my family. I grew up in a multicultural family. Both my parents are black, um, but my father grew up in Southern Delaware and my mother grew up in North Philly. And there are no two places that are different from each other than Southern Delaware and North Philly. Anybody here heard of Delaware before? Anybody here from Delaware by any chance? See, that's what I'm talking about. Everybody in Delaware stays in Delaware. There's something about that, but these are culturally very different places. If I were to describe for you, Southern Delaware would be like Mississippi. If you look at Brown versus Board of Education, you'll find there's a school about three miles from where we grew up as part of an argument for why we need integration. Southern Delaware has a particular history. My father's way of dealing with racial hostility for us growing up in that community, in that Southern space, was to have us in church 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He believed if anybody bothered us because of the color of our skin, we were not supposed to get physical. We're not supposed to sully ourselves with physicality. He believed that if we prayed for them, God would get them back in the end. My father believed in retaliation. It was just spiritual. He believed that one day God was going to get folks back for what they had done, including racial injustice. In that great getting up morning, in that better by and by, God will take care of you. 
He fought for that in the house. My parents argued all the time. City, country, best place to raise a child. And they argued about how you actually problem solve racial hostility. His way was prayer and he fought for it in the house. The people that we grew up with in the church, in um, Georgetown, Delaware, Prospect AME Church, those people also believe the same thing. They helped to raise us. As a, as a, as a child in Sunday school, I love these people because they always gave us candy after Sunday school. As a teenager, I hated these people because they were always in my business. They would tell my parents everything I did for a 40, 50 mile radius of my house. Anybody ever grow up in a community like that? As a teenager, I hated these people. As a grown up though, I love these people because they kept us alive. So when I saw that story in the newspaper, it bothered me to no end. How could somebody talk about my people as if they didn't have hope? They gave me hope. Some of the people where I grew up, they like the fact that uh, my family has gotten a lot of education, my brother and sister, and I have a degree. They think it's nice. University of Penn, eh, that's nice. When I go home, all they care about is whether I remember them. If I speak to them, do I remember who they are? Anybody got people like that? One time I went home on behalf of my father. He told me to go to the Acme supermarket in Georgetown to get some groceries. And then I did that. But I did it in a rushing way. I, I, I was trying to get home quickly so I could get back on the turnpike and in the process of my rushing, I passed by the praying lady in my church, Mrs. Warrington. I passed by her. I did not see her. And now you all know what a praying lady in a church is like, anybody? Everybody in a black church prays. But some, some people, when they pray, God comes for them quicker. Mrs. Warrington was that kind of person. In public, she was small and demure. But when she kneeled down, she rocked the house. She was powerful, but I did not see her. I was in a rush. On my way home, she called my father up. His nickname was Hobby. She said, Hobby, so what's wrong? There's something wrong with your boy. What'd he do? He didn't speak to me. I get home. As soon as I get in, my father said, what did you do? I said, I got, you. I got the milk, I got the eggs. No, you didn't speak to Ms. Warrington. So I had to call Ms. Warrington up and talk to her for an hour about how sorry I was. And Ms. Warrington, I am so sorry. You're absolutely right. There is something wrong with me. And I had to talk and listen to her for an hour, talk about Jesus and what's wrong with the world today. That was the kind of people that I grew up with. My father would represent a sort of Martin Luther King approach to racial hostility. My mother, on the other hand, a very different approach. In North Philly, she was used to walking and running and being chased out of racially segregated neighborhoods on her way to Simon Gratz High School in North Philadelphia. And my mother gave as much as she got. If people weren't supposed to be in her neighborhood, she chased them out just as easily and fought. She was an equal opportunity chaser and fighter. As the oldest of the three, my job was to protect my brother and sister from all enemies, foreign and domestic. My father said, pray, but my mother said, not only is it okay to fight, you can pick up inanimate objects to help you in the cause. Can you imagine what it's like being a family with these strong-willed people arguing vociferously on one side or the other? She meant what she said. When she came to Southern Delaware, she might have thought she was in a whole nother world because she wasn't like the other black or brown people. Black and brown people didn't like her at first and the white people didn't like her either because my mother was different. The black and brown people thought she was haughty. She was city-fied. She didn't understand the culture of folks in Southern Delaware. The white people didn't like her because she spoke her mind. The thing that bothered her often as we were going to the public thoroughfares in Georgetown, Delaware, the Acme supermarket in particular, when we go to these places, the three of us would have to be behind my mother because she walked in a certain way. 
And when she walked, she affected a certain space, affected a certain air. And the three of us would have to stay behind it. We could not be late. If people would go through, they would see her and they would start staring at us and they would stare at us. And my mother would stare back at them until they stopped staring. And the three of us would do the same thing. Going to the supermarket was like going to a war zone because we never knew what was going to happen. My mother exposed us to art, to music, to reading. We exposed to Emmett Till's body from Jet Magazine, very young. She wanted us to know about racism in the world. And she was loving and kind and gentle when she taught us. She went into debt to buy World Book Encyclopedias. We were the only folks in the community that had World Book Encyclopedias. Sometimes my friends would come over. Can I borrow S? We said it's ST, man, it's ST. That's how much she believed in knowledge. But when we were in the supermarket parking lot in the car, she had a very different attitude. She was stressed and she was angry. And she would give us this talk. When we go into this store, I don't want you to ask for nothing or touch nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We said nothing because she wasn't finished. She would stare at us sometimes. And sometimes she would get out of the car, look up into the sky as if to call on God and get back in the car and start as if the conversation as if she had never left. I don't care how many other children are in this store. They're not my children. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Then we said, yes, mom, in three-part harmony because she taught us how to sing. Anybody ever get that talk? Anybody ever give that talk? Anybody ever give that talk today on your way to this symposium? Why does a parent give that talk? Just tell me, anybody. Safety, what else? Excuse me? Behavior, if you act up, they're gonna think, I don't know how to do what I do. Some people say it's financial. Because if you break something, I got to pay for it. I ain't got the money. My mother didn't care about the money. She didn't care about reputation or attitude. It was protection. It was safety. She wanted to teach us the first racial socialization skill. And that is, it's one thing to see yourself as beautiful and handsome. But you don't, that's not enough. In this world, you got to also know how other people don't see you as beautiful and handsome and smart. Not everybody has to get that lesson. Some people, some children can leave home, go to school, go to after school, go to the playground, go to the corner store, come home and always be thought of as a child. But not every parent has that luxury. And it's a burden. And the funny thing, my mom would give us this talk over and over again as if we would act up, but we would never act up. We were too scared to act up because we were in church 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I was always afraid my first Romantic sexual interaction, my whole church was short right in the middle of it. As a teenager, I couldn't, I was ruminating what would happen if the, the praying lady came out of one corner and start praying the house down. Another, uh, the choir would come out of another corner and start singing, Oh, happy day. I could not take it as a teenager, and we never acted up. My brother said, We never acted up. So, why would she give us this talk knowing that we never acted up? because she wasn't talking about us. She was talking about them. She wasn't angry at us. She was angry about them who could not see us as beautiful and wonderfully made. So we're, we'll come out of the car, we go into the supermarket. Some days it's a beautiful thing, nothing happens. Get our food, go home and eat. My brother and sister were not interested in civil rights. We just wanted to eat. But on the days that it was gonna be a class, you, go, you walk in, you can feel the tension, uh, the anxiety, the, the hostility. It, it was so thick, you could cut it with a knife. The Acme supermarket in Georgetown, a place where you belong, but you still don't fit in. The tension was so high, the three of us were stressed. We tried to distract our mother, because in you walk, you see the looks, the sucking of the teeth, the rolling of the eyes. And it bothered us. So we didn't want to clash. So we tried to distract our mother by counting up all the food in the shopping cart. And then she would focus on our math skills 
see how brilliant her kids were. And she didn't see the looks. She didn't hear the rolling or see the rolling of the eyes, sucking of the teeth. Get our food, go home. But on the day there was going to be a clash, it would usually happen in the conveyor belt. Now, my brother Brian and I were speaking together some years back, and he remembered something I forgot at the conveyor belt. He remembered that when we got to the conveyor belt, the person who was angry with my mother's attitude and style in defiance and giving back the change would take the change and slam it on the counter. Shouldn't do that. My mother would just wait until the person picked the, the change up and put it in her hand, which meant a line of people would be behind us, waiting, angry. And the three of us would wait just like this. I didn't remember that. I had forgotten that. What I remembered is when the person in the conveyor belt was angry, they would throw our food in the bag, throw it. And when that happened, it was on. She began to tell the person who they were, who their family was, where to go, how fast to get there. Anybody here been cursed out before? <laughs> Buffalo, y'all don't get cussed out in Buffalo? Anybody been cursed out by a mother from North Philadelphia? Yeah. That, you, you ain't lived until you had that. My mother was awesome. She was incisive. She was surgical. She was clinical. Take 30 seconds, a person be writhing on the floor in utter decay and devastation. She was that good. The three of us would try to warn the person. You probably don't want to mess with my mother today. It's not the day, but it'd be too late. She was good at this. We were in awe, and at the same time, we were stressed because we were worried about retaliation. I tell you that story because when I think about racial literacy, I take from both my parents these ideas. One, sometimes you got to pray, you got to process, you got to pay attention to the, 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 the systemic and proximal harm that comes from racial encounters that go unaddressed. You got to process, ponder. But sometimes you got to say something, you got to do something, you got to protest. And those are two sets of skills, I believe, because we're so phobic, we're so afraid, we are not skilled at. And our children need us to be skilled. They need to be skilled to be able to find their voice, to use it. Because if you take that stuff with you, it doesn't just mess with your mental health. It messes with your back, your heart, your soul. Now, both my parents, I will say, were Christians. The difference is my father prayed before a racial conflict. My mother prayed after, after you were on the ground. Two different ways to think about faith. So what am I saying? Um, I also should tell people, my brother and sister are all a part of the work that we have done. My brother is a famous uh, lawyer. You may have heard of him, Brian Stevenson. He wrote a book called Just Mercy and a movie uh, that was done about that. He started the Equal Justice Initiative down in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, the museum, Peace and Justice Museum in Montgomery, Alabama has the best literature on, and research on lynching in this country, as well as how we understand the transatlantic trade through the Americas. Montgomery is a, is a phenomenally common, but one of the most trafficked ports in the country for enslavement. Some people come to this museum and find ancestors that they had not even known existed. But sometimes my brother's so famous, people don't believe that I'm his brother. They think I photoshopped myself in these pictures. And uh, this is us, his Emmy Award winning uh, HBO special called True Justice. This is us in front of the Supreme Court um, where he argued on behalf of Johnny D. McMillan. So if you've read Just Mercy, you know he was falsely accused for being on, for killing a 16 year old teenager in a dry cleaning store in Monroeville, Alabama, which is the home place of To Kill a Mockingbird. And that's fiction. He was falsely accused. My brother got him off of death row and he had mental health challenges as a function of having to live on death row where for some prisons, death row, are, people are murdered on the same place that people live. It's torture. It's racial torture. 
but people still don't believe that I they, that he's my brother. So I show pictures of us as children. We grew up, stayed in the same bed together till I was 14. And these are my children, my two boys. One, the oldest, named after his uncle, his name is Brian, and my youngest, Julian. Brian is uh, um, 32, and Julian is, four, is 18, and we're not going to talk about how that happened at all. Now, when I'm talking to third graders, they wake up immediately when I show them this, because they can smell a Michael B. Jordan picture in their sleep, and they stay awake for the rest of the presentation. Uh, I got to hang out on the set for 12 hours in, in nighttime in Georgia, best time ever hanging out with Michael B. Jordan. What am I saying? Everybody has a powerful and important racial story. Your racial story is not better than mine. Mine's not better than yours. But if you don't know it, that's on you. you, you you're going to need to excavate it. That means the ugly, the rupture, as Wade Nobles would talk about, but also the splendor. And that's where we get our superpower to tell our story. Because other people will tell one for you. This is a, the website I was telling you about of where we do our work, come to that. But not everybody's gonna like your story. Some people, when they hear your story, contract, others upon hearing expand, and this is how you know. When we look at equity, we see it through a both end lens. We're interested in how opposites can coexist at the same time. Sometimes we are brilliant, and other times we're as clueless as a doorknob. And in that sense, we have to think about racial problems very differently. Some of the assumptions I make both systemic and proximal racism undermines health outcomes through stress. We need both relationship and systemic change. Um, but if you don't get the, the, the matter, if you change the system, it doesn't mean you're going to change relationships because legal remedies won't heal the trauma that we all have been going through. Racial competence is more important than character. Being good is not good enough. We never say to algebra, folks who are looking to be algebra teachers, if they're kind and gentle and they they have nice pets, but they hate fractions. We would never hire them as algebra teachers. So why, why can't we expect professionals to be competent in the skills of negotiating racial conflict and trauma, regardless of what your job is? Society, all of us have been racially socialized to run, to fight, flight, and fright, or just avoid when we're stressed. And we know that this stress undermines competence and ethics, and the only way to address it is we've got to be exposed to stressful situations to prepare us. The work that I and others have done around the talk has demonstrated that the children who get to talk more are more prepared for the hostility than those who don't get to talk. And I believe we can change racial outcomes in proximal spaces. If you look at the research on racial encounters, they don't only affect your feelings, they affect your thoughts and your body. And so we need a strategy that embraces all of those aspects. And I believe it affects your soul. We need all of that in order to find our voice. We're not just interested in when the encounter happens. We're interested in what happens before, during, and after because of its long-term effects. Sometimes something hasn't happened yet, but we ruminate about it might happening can still undermine our well-being. And we see this in children in elementary school. If they've gone through incredible rejection, they worry about the next time. And even if it doesn't come, it impacts how they see themselves, how they sleep. If you look at the research on racial stress and trauma being health, harmful to the health of people of color, you've got Claude Steele's notion of a racing mind, Will Smith's notion of racial battle fatigue, the ruminations I would describe, the presumption of dangerousness, the impact on breast cancer in black women, and the more we know about sleep quality, we understand that if you are worried about somebody seeing you um, as different, and that difference is a problem, it affects your sleep. We know the very physical face-to-face -face encounters with Black men, this work has been done. Neuroscience work supports the notion that Black men, in this particular study by Sophia Chawalter, um, are perceived as older, larger, and closer than they really are. Almost like in this case, in showing images, that black men how, somehow capture attention, much like evolved threats, like spiders and snakes. Now, you know how you might react to spiders and snakes. Think about that being your 12-year-old boy. Somebody's triggered in that particular way. This is a picture of my 
outside of our church in my teen years. Another element we think about, and I apologize for the fashion, poor fashion statement, but my point here is that my brother is up there in the upper right. He has a full beard at 16. He could grow that beard early as 12. I couldn't grow hair until I was in my 40s. But the way that people saw him as older meant he got different drama because he was thought of as older racially than I did looking younger. The work by Philip Goff is just amazing. In the study, he found that black boys being viewed as older and less innocent as 10 years compared to white boys. And the folks in the study projected the, the black boys to be four and a half years older than they really are. You know how that changes your mindset about how much love and care you give to a teenager versus a child? It causes dehumanization. But it's also true for five-year-olds. It's also true for girls girls of color who are thought of as more adult-like, folks feel like they can withhold affection, they can withhold caring. This notion of adultification has been found to affect long-term outcomes in and out of school. If I ask you right now, which grade do you think students of all racial groups are likely to be expelled the most? How many of you would say elementary school? You didn't think you were gonna get a test today, I, I get it. How many of you would say middle school? How many of you would say high school? Most people, when I ask this, say seventh and eighth grade around the country. I've been asking it since 2005. And I think their answer has nothing to do with the question. I think they just hated themselves in seventh and eighth grade. I think they hated the way people looked at them in seventh and eighth grade. The answer is pre-K. And if you look up Walter Gilliam's work, brilliant work, out of Yale, he and I are good friends. He's been saying for quite a while, since 2005, that pre-K students are expelled for three times the rate for K through 12 students. I was just in Canada. They don't, they don't allow expulsion. We do. But that's not the point he's trying to make. He's saying this is a racial problem and it's not a child problem. We don't have data to support that black and brown children are disproportionately behaviorally problematic. These are adult issues, which he defines as egregious overreactions driven by their bias expectations, which I call racial stress or racial um, overreaction. So what do we do? If racial stress and hate harm our bodies, hearts, and minds, how do we heal from this? We think racial socialization is one strategy, talking about it, not only to our children, but to ourselves, right? And the way that we've looked at this talk or talks is that it's not just what we say to young people, it's also what they acquire, what they get. And my, it might need translation, but its goal is to protect and affirm help for encounters and conflicts. If you look at the research on this work from preschool through adolescence, we see benefits for those children who have had some feedback about what to do when or if somebody should. The truth though, is also an issue for parents. Parents who worry about their children being racially profiled are also um, um, struggling. They get a benefit though, if they can give the talk in a very appropriate way. We know a lot more about white youth and their exposure. They're more likely to receive colorblind racial socialization, which is likely to deny race differences, racism, harm, or privilege to hold social preferences and biases favoring non-Black people early on in early childhood, to be stressed by appearing prejudiced and racially stressful encounters. So the part of socialization that we can change is how much we do talk about it. But what that means is that anybody who doesn't get that feedback is less likely to speak up when an injustice happens. The good news is that talking helps. Friendships help. Preparation and practice helps. One quick study, uh, just a little bit of research. We do studies for children in, in schools. These are students of color who report high levels of negative racial interactions with peers and teachers. And the higher those are, the more stressed those students are. They also perceive their school as a threatening space with one caveat that those in that blue line also report that they have a strategy on what to do when it happens. They feel more confident to engage those encounters that are negative or positive. Same thing for school belonging. 
belonging drops. But if there is a way, if I'm more stressed by these interactions, I feel less like I belong in school. But the one buffer to that is if I feel like I have a strategy on what to do when somebody steps to me. So heal first is around how well do we regulate our stress, build our confidence, and then confront hate. The problem with racial socialization or the benefit is that it helped us see those things. The problem is when we talk to young people, they say, dad, mom, that's nice, but it's just saying to be proud to be black doesn't help me when somebody's stepping into my space. So racial literacy is about how do we help young people and ourselves come up with a strategy about how to read, recast, and resolve in a more unique way. And that's around how well do I see the racial elephant in the room? How well do I uh, decode the scripts and interpret the meaning of what's happening? Not only in others, but in myself. Recasting is about, let's say I'm stressed at an eight, nine, and 10. How do I bring that down to a level that is useful and workable? And this is where the CLCBE comes in. Do I have a strategy to notice what's happening to my body, thoughts, and feeling? and to do something about it, to calm myself, to heal first, before I make a decision on what to do next. When we teach young men how not to curse out cops, we have a class on how not to curse out cops. And part of it is we wanna embrace the anger that they have about being mistreated and dehumanized, but to know that, that in this world, the world is prepared for them in the most violent ways. So how do we help them notice what happens to your body when you hear the siren? What comes to your mind? What choices do you wanna make? And this process helps do that. Resolving is around, do I make a healthy decision that leads to my life, allows me to get back home to my family? Um, I'm gonna press ahead. How much time do I have? Eight minutes, okay. Um, some years back when Freddie Gray was killed in the back of a police van outside of Baltimore. I was called to the Maryvale Prep Catholic School in Baltimore. First time within a week I was asked to come because the, the black girls in the classes were crying because the students, mostly white students, were harassing them when they saw the images of the riots of children in Baltimore. And those students all were from Baltimore, but those black girls were taking the heat. They were getting called slurs and names. And the only reason I got a call is because the girls wouldn't stop crying in class. They couldn't even go through with class. Not only them, but their white allies who witnessed what was happening. So the girls were afraid to retaliate though because their parents had spent so much money to keep them in their school. Two jobs, some of them, just to keep them in the school. So they were fearful of expulsion and they were fearful of their parents. So we got the deans to give permission for a two and a half hour session where we could practice healthy racial comeback lines. So they could use their voice about what they would want to say and what to do. Healthy racial comeback line is basically, how do I say this was not right for what happened to me? The goal is that you don't ever have to say them to the person unless you, are, unless you want to, unless you practice it. You must learn to say them to yourself first. If you don't believe it, you can't sell it. We practice healthy and unhealthy comeback lines because we wanna to get to the intensity of the assault that has happened to you to know it and understand it. The goal is about healing, not harm, confrontation, not retaliation, dignity, not dehumanization. But we don't expect you to ever deliver it without practice. Like if you ever told a joke and you screw up the punchline and everybody's laughing at you instead of the joke, we don't want that. Use your style, movement, attitude, rhythm, and tone. By the end of two hours, I mean, I've never seen the best comeback lines ever from middle school and high school, black girls and their white allies. White allies needed stress support as well because they did not know what to say. They did not know what to do with some of their best friends. We have several projects that we've been working on, some with teachers and students. We also have a project where we train African-American barbers to be health educators to black men between the age of 18 to 24 while they're cutting their hair. The mothers, the men tell us that the barbershop is the one place that they, one of the few places they go where 95% of their time, they don't even 
feel good when they leave, they look good as well. Barbers have a certain style about them, a cultural way to communicate very key information that they can use, that the men listen to, because some men will go to a barbershop, stay all day and never get a haircut, but it is a mental health space. I can talk the way I wanna talk. I can argue the way I wanna argue. And we think that's an important place to think about. We also use basketball as another thing. Pray Project, we could talk about that. The Embrace Project is where we help families who want to talk more to their children about these issues uh, as a unit. At any rate, I won't spend as much time. The only thing I would say, we were able to get to 700 of those men and found that not only did the intervention help those men to take care of themselves better. It also reduced fighting and arguments and violence with a partner, with a peer, and a stranger three months after the intervention. Our goal is to try to increase the chances that we support natural healers and mentors in neighborhoods and communities, because we will not educate enough to get therapists in the world for the need that we have in communities. So we need to pick folks who are natural healers. Some of our work shows up on Sesame Street. If you get a chance, the Racial Justice Initiative for very young children who want to breathe, feel, and share as a way to notice what's happening to your body and then make choices about it. When we ask people to do a workshop, we give them this question, what racial messages or interactions do you remember while growing up? And then we ask them how they feel. And initially people are very angry and shameful. But five minutes later, I'll ask him another question. If you had a do-over, what would you do differently? And it's still sadness, but there's a different approach. There's a different understanding. We avoid so much. We are scaring ourselves that there's nothing that can be done about racial injustice. And we need white people to be more agentic about these issues. We're not going to address systemic racism, in my humble opinion, if everybody doesn't get on board. I think we should heal first before we fight. We gotta fight, that is no question, but we gotta heal first. All right, my, my take home points is I end school discrimination undermines school achievement for all teenagers. Racial stress disrupts our bodies, feelings and thoughts. And so our healing has to include all of those elements. Feeling threatened is not the problem. Not knowing that I am threatened is the problem. Not getting help when I am threatened by racial moments by young black children, that is the problem. We can do something about racial stress. It's observable, it's resolvable, it's manageable. Courage is around, how can I see this? Racial literacy is not blame, but accountability and preparation. So the question we ask, are you prepared to heal first? Martin Luther King gave his, was writing his letter from a Birmingham jail. And in this one excerpt, he's not a preacher or a civil rights leader. He becomes a parent. He says, you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television. He's having a racial stress response while he's writing this essay. And then he goes on to say, see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky. That's what we are trying to do. We're trying to prevent those ominous clouds of inferiority. So the lying story would never be known as long as a hunter is the one to tell it. What is your story? Thank you very much. Uh, we thank you, Dr. Stevenson, uh, for sharing your thoughts and expertise um, for starting this important conversation today around racism, racial literacy, and mental health. Um, now we would like to further the conversation through our panelists uh, who represent several different units on our campus. So I'm going to introduce our uh, panelists. We're going to have a conversation. I have some questions, but we'll open it to the audience for questions as well. Um, so we can talk a little bit more um, about the issues of racism, racial literacy, and mental health. So I want to introduce uh, Dr. Isaac Burke. He is a associate professor of school counseling in the Graduate School of Education. Um, Dr. Um, Ayago, Ayago, 
um, Kamina, Assistant Dean for Student Development and Academic um, Enhancement at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Science, Dr. Christopher St. Ville, Assistant Professor in School of Social Work. Um, and then we also pleased to have Pastor um, Kinzer Pointer from um, Agape Fellowship Baptist Church and a member of the Erie County Medical Center Board of Directors. Uh, before getting underway, we are fortunate to have volunteers from the UB um, Medical School who stand at a uh, stand ready with microphones if you would like to ask questions. Um, uh, please just raise your hand and a volunteer will come by. For those of you joining us online, please drop a question into the Q&A. As time allows, we will share it with the panelists. So I would like to uh, start off with um, a question and we'll focus on um, Pastor Porner for this one. Um, so, so our first question concerns uh, the elephant in the room, right? Um, this question is directed towards Reverend Porner and others on the panel. How did we get here? How did Buffalo Seaside become a target for racialized violence? And has the University of Buffalo historically contributed to any of these inequities? Wow. Um, well, we got here through a series of circumstances that are uniquely American. Um, we have created a circumstance in which we ask people to live, in which we've um, instituted policies that really don't allow people to live. And so because those policies are in place, um, people suffer in a number of ways that really look invisible, but they're there every day. They, um, they have divested Black families of wealth. They have put that wealth in the hands of families that are not Black. Um, we've not dismantled any of those policies, although as a nation, we've repeatedly suggested that we've made racial strides, but I would offer to you that you cannot make racial strides until you dismantle all of those policies that lead to those negative outcomes. And then there's a there's a you know uniquely American reality is that you know we teach racism in all of our institutions in multiple ways, and we divest people of their humanity when we do that. Has the university contributed to it? Of course, the university has contributed to it. It is an institution. But I think where we are today is that we're more enlightened than we were previously, and there's a lot of work to be done. And I think we can be succinct about that work if we begin simply by making a decision to do justly. Any other comments? From the panel. So this was about healing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we get here? I mean, Dr. Stevens said Dr. Stevenson said that we need to heal before we can can we move forward. Well, part of the reason we can't heal is because we refuse to have this conversation about slavery, right? About this reparations, about what has happened in this in this country to black people. We haven't healed from the Rosewood Massacre. We haven't healed from Colfax, Arkansas. We haven't healed from the from the draft riot in, in, in New York. So this this just compounds the trauma that the racial trauma um, that Black people experience. And unfortunately, we have to teach our children. We have to teach our children um, about racism, and it's an uncomfortable conversation to have. A lot of our children don't understand it, but we this is. We have to have this conversation, and a lot of people in our country still don't think we, we, we need to have the conversation. They feel as if kids aren't prepared to, to have this conversation, especially a lot of white kids. And, um, and a lot of black kids, a lot of black families don't have the luxury to not have that conversation. But we're not healing yet because we refuse to acknowledge the atrocities that have been done to African Americans in this country, of which Tops is just the most recent. So um, a year later, after the tragedy, many people are still mentally and physically affected by the Tops massacre. What should we as a university community, especially from the schools of medicine and education, do to ensure that we are both proactive and reactive 
um, to this tragedy? In other words, what are the appropriate action steps we need to make to ensure our citizens receive the care slash services that they deserve and need? It's back on. Sorry. All right. Um, I can start us off on this conversation because I think that it's been touched on in the talks that we've had and even in the conversations that we're having now about we know that social economic factors are not alone, are not the only factors that are contributing to this health disparity. So the question of the something else, part of that, as we know, is about the structural and institutional racism that exists. Um, and so how do we as in academic institutions work on changing policies and highlighting the laws and the and the you know practices that are in place that are continuing to ex exacerbate these um these health health inequities and so just thinking about it as somebody who's in an academic setting you know i'm thinking about how we teach our and train our future scientists and physicians and you know i the, the model that we always have usually is that you learn about x disease and you know the first kind of background information is that it affects the minoritized group that disproportionately. And then we move on to the next slide. And so the question of how did that come about and why is that still the narrative that we still have and why do we not talk about you know, why that disparity exists? So I think changing curriculum and changing how we educate our students um, and help, helping them learn about the system and the systemic things that are in place that are you know, influencing that way that when they go into practice and they are in, you know, in the environment, they see their role in social justice, their training as physicians, as scientists in impacting policies and impacting um, you know, the practices that are, in, uh, that are actively uh, dispor disproportionately affecting uh, people of color. The other part of this also is that in engaging with community, um, being, you know, being intentional in the collaboration and then also listening to the people you collaborate with uh, is a really important aspect. And you know, I'll just use an example of, we just had a community fair that our initial goal was just to open the doors and have individuals come and um, share, organizations share about their work because we wanted to learn what are you doing? How can we help? How can we get involved? And the outcome of that was not only community organizations saying, we can collaborate, we can help each other. There's this thing that you're doing that I'm, I, you know, I need help with. And then also us learning about all of the different community organizations and what they do um, so the people who may want to volunteer that maybe don't have time to even know where to start now have a place to come to be able to do that. So I think being very intentional and not performative about how we respond to community needs is also a big factor. I hate to hog up the time, but I mean, <laughs> in terms of education, um, we need to start telling the truth about history and stop and stop sanitizing it. I mean, in my in my classes in particular with social work, I try to I try to expose them to the historical accuracies that we tend to gloss over in history, especially the ones that where America doesn't look too nice. And how do we connect those histories and those policy moves historically to the policy moves that are going on today or the policy moves that are not going on today? So we need to kind of, yeah, I agree, we need to change that curriculum, but it, be, it needs to be done in a way where it's empowering to students and not disabling. Um, and, and then we can see globally there are things going on around the world right now, globally, currently, right now, that are a result of historically how we interacted with the world. So we have to bring that history, and education needs to do it, social work needs to do it, psychology needs to do it. We need to all kind of reframe the way that we present this American exceptionalism to our students and give them a much more critical view um, of how they need to start thinking about the issues in our country. There was actually something that you said, Dr. Stevenson, I'm just going to piggyback off what I've heard everybody else say, but you mentioned something about lens. And from my perspective, we have this deficit model that we tend to correspond with without even thinking about it. And we can look at black populations or black people through the lens of the problem, or we can look at the problem through the lens of black people or the black population. And I'm just piggybacking off what, what you said. We, we do have this traditional deficit model where we find out what's wrong, like everything that's going on. But if you ask 
if you talk to individuals from black populations or even people of color, and well, what, what are you experiencing? Exactly how you talk about you know, your lived experience, mm -hmm. you get a different perspective. And so even when it comes to mental health, I mean, we have the same antiquated theories that have, we've been utilizing since like the 60s and 70s. How come we don't utilize indigenous theories or Afrocentric or Africana psychology in dealing with populations? And so mm -hmm. even though we still have a plethora of mental health services available, people don't want to go because we compartmentalize and don't take the parts of them that can be fruitful. So once again, going back to my original thing, we can look at black people or people of color through the problem or as black people, okay, how do you see it? And that's one of the very first starts or one of the very first initial ways that we can work and try to help populations to heal. And just to piggyback on that, right, on the, so I talked about what education could do, right, and we need to reframe the way that we tell the story about our country and our history and stuff. In terms of the community, Dr. Stevenson pointed out to natural healers, healers in the community. Um, any of y'all that heard me talk the other day, I talked about the, the, the role of credible messengers, people that come from the community and work with these young people um, and, and, and have that trust, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a PhD, um, pretty privileged, you know, and I have a hard time finding a mental health counselor, right? So if me being educated in social work, mm -hmm. right, um, you know, with the with the level of, of privilege that I have and status, and I have a hard time finding a health a mental health um counselor. Yeah. What do you think? How hard do you think it would be for the average Joe on the east side who's who's not in a position that I am to be able to find a competent mental health counselor? We have a mental health crisis in this country, and we have a, we have a, a dearth of mental health counselors who are able to meet that 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 level of need. So at the end of the day, this natural heal healer piece that Dr. Stevenson was talking about, we have. Listen, we need to start teaching people in the community on how to talk to each other, okay? We all, um, there's recent research that just came out that showed the level of isolation that's going on in America and how many people in America don't, don't have a person to talk to, right? If we, if we have, pe if you have people to talk to, it's not, it's not a replacement for a, a licensed mental health counselor, but it's somebody to bounce stuff off of in, in the event that you're going through a crisis. You got somebody to talk to. We need to build that model up. We need to build that model up and figure out how can we create natural, and I, I'm, I'm going to just say mental health counselors who are not licensed in the community, bring back a sort of paraprofessional framework where people can have access to people to talk to. What um, Dr. Stevenson um, is talking about when he talks about healing and what Dr. St. Bill is alluding to right now um, when he refers to the Surgeon General's advisory on isolation, um, for someone like me, it's nothing new. Um, I've been seeing this for years in my in my work and in my ministry. But let me let me make it absolutely clear to you that while this has been going on, I have seen a shift in the last ten or fifteen years. I have seen a shift. Um, what Dr. Stevenson asked the question about who is the most expelled school um, student. As a board member, a former board member of the Buffalo Board of Education, I knew that answer. But I also knew that answer as a pastor. Because when those children get expelled, their mm -hmm. parents are like, what's wrong with my child? And I have, to, I have to first defuse them. There's nothing wrong with your child. Mm -hmm. What we're faced with is a circumstance where the institutions that we entrust our children to are ill-equipped yeah. to handle our children. They simply don't know what to do. And then often younger parents have no tools whatsoever and they lack the framework of the family that Dr. Stevenson and I grew up in. Um, we had the same mother, by the way. Um, <laughs> So when you lack that kind of loving framework around you to up undergird you, to support you, to scaffold up around you, it becomes really important that we learn how to teach that to each other as we're moving through this entire um, experience that we call life. 
And when we're talking about isolation, we've got to notice the isolation that not just, you know, 15 years ago, I would have told you that was commonplace amongst the elderly. But I'm telling you right now today that that's commonplace from the, the cradle up. And I'll tell you what it challenges us to do. It challenges us to not only build additional professionals and paraprofessionals, as Dr. St. Bill is alluding to, but it also challenges us to see each other mm -hmm. and to be there with each other and to wrap ourselves up in each other. Because no, there isn't a great deal of healing that has gone on in the last year, simply because we don't have the skill. We don't have the know-how. And, and sadly, we often don't have the wherewithal. And so it becomes really critically important for us to begin to notice each other. And look, have a conversation about nothing, but have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I do when my grandchildren come to visit is I disallow all of the devices, including mine, so that then we're forced to figure out how to hang out, mm -hmm. how to talk to each other. Yeah. Um, I always defer to them on the menu so that is what they want to eat. I was surprised a few weeks ago when my granddaughter and grandson came to me and said, Granddad, we want ramen. So, you know, I'm thinking, no problem. Let's just order ramen. They said, nope, granddad, that's not what we want. <laughs> what we want is to go to the market, buy what we need, come home, and make the ramen ourselves. Well, I'm not Japanese. And so I said, well, find a recipe. And then we did that. And so in those small instances, we build something that is invisible but it's important and it's, it's, it's called interaction and community. And it becomes important for us, not just to do that in our family, but then to reach outside of our safety circle and invite others in to see the humanity of every person that we meet. And then this honor that humanity by saying, listen, I noticed that you are not me. So tell me about you and then be intent, listen, hear them, and then ask the question that nobody is expecting you to ask. Teach me part of your social strata and your culture, who you are, who's responsible for you, where you came from, and begin to build those those mechanisms that begin to help us to understand that in all of what we see, we're alike. Thank you. We have a few questions um, from our online audience here. So I'll start with this one. This is for Dr. Stevenson. Uh, the um, a participant said, thank you for your talk today. Your focus on healing is invaluable. However, I note that most of the focus is on how Black children should respond to racialized experiences and microaggressions. However, what about those who perpetrate these actions? Yeah, I get that a lot. Um, and partly, I would try to say to folks, um, our, our goal is to take care of our kids. Just can we can we add the care to include how to protect yourself from racial hostility? It would be no different than giving them an umbrella when they go outside in the rain. But giving them an umbrella doesn't mean they're responsible. I think the question families have to think about is how long will you wait till these systems change before you talk to your children? We all would like to have a system work for our kids, not only in school, but when they go to the, up to, uh, the emergency room or if they get arrested. And I'm, I've struggled with that. My brother's done some amazing work around changing systems 
Miller versus Alabama, 2012. You can see um, Supreme Court said you can no longer be kept in jail as a young person, as young as 13, for the rest of your life for capital and non-capital crime. We were the only country in the U.S. that ever did that. Only. But do you, he told me very clearly, you know how many states want to get back that right to put 13 and 14 year olds back in there? for their entire life, for capital and non-capital crimes. So the fight about systems change is always gonna be happening. I'm saying I can take care of mine a lot better than systems can. So not only natural healers, but also family has to be able to say, um, until systems become the way that we expect them to be healthy, I still gotta do something. I can't wait for that. How long do you wait is the question. Now, I think our stories are healing. I think telling our stories. Sometimes we don't tell our children stories because we what? We want to take care of them. We want them to feel like there's possibility in the world, even though we have gone through hell ourselves. I'm just saying, sometimes you tell the story. Kids used to tell us um, when we get with them that my parents always give me the mountaintop story. They always give me the mountaintop. But when I'm in the valley, I need a valley story. Tell me when you were struggling. Because I can relate, because I'm struggling right now. And so I don't think that necessarily means you're responsible because you, you're preparing your children. You're not responsible for racism. But you can't go out in the rain with no umbrella and expect not to get wet. Or not to develop a cold. And so it's not about whether our children are responsible, in my opinion. So. Thank you, thank you. Do we have any questions in the audience? Um, uh, yes, um, Dante McFadden, the uh, director of the Distinguished Visiting Scholars Program at UB. And uh, Dr. Stevenson, thank you very much for being here and thank you for your presentation and thank you very much for the panel for your comments. I'd like to uh, speak directly about the idea of natural healers and how that um, ties to a dearth of uh, a mental health counselors that can speak about racial healing. And then also how that ties into um, what was discussed earlier about belonging versus fitting in and fitting in like internalizing abuse to not make your colleagues uh, confront their blind spots or even expose their lack of willingness to engage. And, um, you know, Dr. Stevenson uh, presented a great example of this with the line story, but I'm curious to know uh, to the entire panel, um, you know, what have you observed in terms of um, ways people have developed a framework that pri prioritizes mental health and nurturing that is asset based as opposed to deficit based? How long do you want me to answer that question? <laughs> I well, one of the first things that comes to the mind is uh, what is mental health? I, you know, we can think of mental health as going into a place, a clinic, and having someone talk to you for 45, maybe an hour, or it can be having a pastor. It can be having a community. You talk about one of the things that that I really resonated with, which is idea when it talked about like natural healers. But what about community? Like, what about having individuals? that there's the idea that it takes you know, a village to raise a child. And even though that's not necessarily an African proverb, there has, there's a lot of resonance with that. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to like deficit, we, we think we have to do this. We have to go, you, you were struggling with depression. It may be depression. Or it could just be the simple fact that you're isolated and that you've had this, or that you're not getting enough sleep. You live in, in a place that has a lot of noise pollution. So you're not sleeping well. And as Dr. Susan said, not sleeping well is going to mess with your cognitive abilities, physical. And then your interaction with people when you're tired and somebody wants to be racist with you and you respond in a certain way that you said, mm -hmm. uh, you said you had the two aspects, the father and the mm -hmm. mother, where you yeah. respond more mm -hmm. with the mother. So, I mean, when, when it comes to having like more of a so positive or, or strength-based, I think we need to look and see what strength things are in the community of having connections. I, I have twiddled with a, an idea of having a community based. It's not necessarily mental health, but everybody has a different skill. Everybody has a different asset. 
and almost that quid pro quo, but working with people very similar to like in a village. You can do this well, I can do this well. And that in itself can help buffer against some of the issues that we encounter. And so that's what I think about when it does come. It doesn't have to be this, and I don't want to like kind of go off on a soapbox because I told Dr. King I would try to be succinct, but <laughs> the I the idea of this European, Western, we have to sit down and do this for 45 minutes. I know a lot of people who don't want to sit down and talk for 45 minutes, but they can play basketball. We can talk a lot. Part of my research interest is, is utilizing martial arts or capoeira as a clinical intervention. And I cannot tell you how many people respond when you're actually doing something physical. Mm -hmm. Movement-based mo modality, yes. not just sitting there talking. Because I, yes. I, I, my background is clinical mental health, and I don't like to talk. You can ask my wife. So <laughs> I don't want to sit there and talk for 45, 60 minutes, and I'm the one that should be the expert with this. So part of the idea of, of, of going from less deficit-based is getting out of that paradigm that we have to sit here and do this. I mean, like the Marines say, you have to improvise, adapt, and overcome. I feel like that's something that we're, we're missing when we talk about mental health and we try to fit people to a paradigm that may not necessarily be appropriate for them or was ever really appropriate for them. But with that, I'll pass it off to my colleagues here and mm -hmm. let, let them speak about it as well. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know if I'm answer your question, but when, I, when I'm thinking about mental health, right, um, in this country, um, so let me say from this standpoint, you know, when I get off my Zoom meetings and stuff, you know, a lot of my colleagues say the same thing. Oh, take care of yourself. Oh, don't forget self-care, right? How much self-care can you do in a country where people walk in to middle school and elementary school bringing the air and killing our children, right? The anxiety levels in our country the fear of average people just walking around, and then black people's trauma is compounded because of the racial piece in our every day to day, in our day to day existence, right? The goalposts for mental health keep changing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We are being, we're, we, we are being, um, you know, tasked with dealing with huge amounts of stresses. Um, at what point are we going to say that we are crazy? We are a crazy society. When we adjust to mass shootings, when we adjust to the everyday shootings, when we adjust to the everyday oppression that is going on, when we adjust to the to the to the to the craziness that our policy that our politicians engage in, and we go about life like it's day to day, we crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's Serbia. I think they had two mass shootings. Yo, they about to tear down their whole country. They had two. Two. We had a hundred something this year, and we're figuring out how to walk around and be sane. How can you be sane when every day your child jumps on the bus, they might get shot? How can you be sane in a society that continues that continuously devalues you? over hundreds of years. How can you be sane? I think we need to have a discussion around how we keep moving the goalposts. And the reason that we have all these things going on are because there's a lot of people that are not able to meet that bar where the new goalposts are. It's harder to be resilient. It's harder to be resilient today than it was two or three years ago. Um, I, I, thank you, Dr. Sandel. One of the things that exasperates me in this, um, in this society that we're in today, that we have simply um, decided that we will not create any safe place for young people, for children, for students, no matter where they are on the, on this, on the continuum of their education. There is no safe place. They can't be safe at home. They can't be safe in the community. They can't be safe in school because we will not have the honest conversation 
around our fascination with violence. And we are the most violent society in the history of man. And we have gun manufacturers right now deciding how to create more weapons to kill more people, to tear through Kevlar vests and all kinds of other obstructions because we are so fascinated with violence. And we, we, we will not have an earnest, honest conversation around the fact that we allow that to go on. And, and um, uh, Dr. St. Bill is really kind when he says we're crazy. We butt ass off of our rocker. It's not just crazy. It is something that is so egregious that it defies a, an explanation or a description. But the power is with us. And look, the late Tip O'Mill said all politics is local. So we should start right here with our own common council and insist that they create the kind of legislation and that we implement it as a community and then dare anybody to come in here and tell us that we can't choose to be safe in our own community. Hello, I wanted to say I'm for 68 years of my life, I went through race and I've seen it from a child. I'll be 71 this month. And for you to talk about, we're still going through what I saw, my mother saw, my grandparents, my great grandparents, not much has changed. In between, we got educated, but now we're failing again in this area. And I'm gonna say, you know, I saw John F. Kennedy assassinated because I was in the school with majority of white children and we were watching the TV, it was so great. And all of a sudden I saw that in the sixth grade. I think a lot of us were in shock then. If you're around that age, it was so shocking and to see it live. So this has been happening with the guns. But I was gonna say, we, I saw Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, Malcolm X, the Black Panthers. When you go through all that, it makes you a little different. And I'd like to say too that you need to go to the elders. All of us that went through, I graduated from UB. And in UB, there was racism in the 70s Probably in the 80s, I saw a little. My girlfriends were very intelligent, but they weren't allowed to attend the nursing school. They were so disappointed. They just let go of their career, but I stayed in there because I was raised by my family how to fight back verbally, to learn, to speak for yourself. And that was generations. My grandfather was with W.E.B. Du Bois. He's in books. So I feel that, um, this thing of them saying that this person that murdered the people in tops, it didn't happen overnight. I, the first school I went to was in Cortland, Cortland, New York. And I never forgot, we were there for orientation in the summer and all the boys, they were black, Puerto Rican from the Dominican and they ran up at night and said, they're burning crosses in the field. Now the young man that killed the people in Buffalo, he didn't live too far from that. And I'm talking about the 70s. My mother sang in the 40s in Elmira. She could sing. The black people could only clean the hotel and they had to peek through the window. That broke her heart in the 40s. So while I was in Cortland, these boys saw the, people didn't believe they saw these crosses burning in the field. I believed them for some reason I said. And so one of the professors one day came to class and said, look at this. She had an application that came from downtown at the small hardware back then in the 70s application for the Ku Klux Klan. The same place I went and they seemed so nice to fix my luggage, like any young student had ripped. And then on top of it, that whole area have children that have Down syndrome, excuse me. And that's because you wanted pure white. So this thing of saying this young man that just came over the internet, wrong. It's been there forever. My girlfriend, Rod Sterling was her uncle. And her mother, her grandmother told her, across Elmira was a sign, welcome to the KKK claim, country. So let's not just say this just happened and we don't know where it came from. I used to talk for years about this. Why aren't you investigating? It's going on down there. Right in Pennsylvania, you have a graveyard where everyone had incest and, and they asked us, remember, 
Why do you think those little graves are in front of, in front of the tall graves? Through incest, keeping it pure, children die. And that is in a religious group. I won't bring it up. But this is going on. It's not an overnight thing. And I think that you could ask the elders. You have quite a few people that graduated from UB, from all the colleges around and away. And they will work with you. You're talking about getting people to work with you? I'm working now with groups. And what I'm saying, we're out there, but you need to connect. You need to connect, and I represented women that were sexually harassed on the job, men that were disabled. So it's not just a one thing, but you got to realize we all need it, and, and we have to join together. We come from the 70s and 60s. There was love at the time, right? Somehow you got separated because the government said, that's not right. So I just wanted to say it because I hear you. But there's something had to be done and you got to go back. Like you say, healing, go back. Go back to the people and go back to the ones that we fought to get this far. And it's no, it's a race thing, of course. But I just say, this is not an overnight incident, okay? I, and I would like to know, do you ever think about it or reach out to us or reach out to the community to help you? Thank you. You know, we, we trying to do a couple things. Um, we got the Health Equity Research Institute going on, and you know, we have a couple of uh, things going on in the community. But make sure we try to get your name. Let me get. Let me make sure you give me your name, your organization, so we can try to reach out to you and do some things with you. But there are definitely some initiatives and different efforts going on at UV. Whether it's there, whether they're suffice, you know, everybody will have their own opinion. But there are some efforts going on. <clears throat> If I could put a plug in for talking to the elders and talking, uh, there's so many um, undertapped resources in our community. And I think um, we do see the rupture. We see, the, we see and we hear the stories, but I still think we are not telling the stories either. I think there's a way in which um, we can gain so much from hearing from folks. When we talk to the barbers and we reached about 800 uh, young men between the age of 18 and 24, the barbers, when we would go in, we helped them develop some of the counseling skills, but we wanted them to do it in their own cultural style. There's some healing things happening naturally that we just don't tap into. When you're in a barber's chair, you are a captive. That barber can not only just give you feedback about the world, the barber touches you and moves you around. And men allow that because it feels safe. The ability to argue without having to worry that somebody is going to think of you as less than a person is healthy. The barbers told us that they feel like they're silent heroes that nobody ever asks what's going on. They feel like they've stopped murders, they've stopped conflicts, they will have rival gang members, and I'm speaking about Philadelphia, but they feel like they are heroes, but, but they're silent. Nobody ever finds out. And when we went to ask them, they told us so many things. Men who come out of prison, can't find jobs, told us that when I went in, some of the churches I was in have left, but the barbershops were still there. The only place I could get a job. So I, I'm affirming what you're saying be, um, because the stories that folks have can still be part of our healing. And I do believe it's a war zone. I do believe it's crazy. But when we talk to young people, third graders, and ask them to find their voice about when somebody has misrepresented them, my God, you see how if you have your own voice, you don't have to wait on somebody else. It's not just useful for racial rejection, it's useful for sexual harassment, for dating violence. But part of it is we can't stop preaching. My father didn't talk a whole lot. He was a dancer out in the world. And when it came to church, he would sh shout every Sunday. As a child, I was always worried about my father because once he started yelling, he was dancing all over the church. As a kid, I didn't understand it. 
I'm like, how anybody, they call it get happy. He don't look happy to me as a five-year-old. I, I wrote an essay about what it's like to be a five-year-old watching your dad get happy in church. It's scary as hell. <laughs> but I learned over time what it meant. He couldn't talk all the way his stuff out, but he could dance his stuff out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why don't we embrace that? That's therapy. Testimony service. Supposed to start at 1030 for a half an hour. Ends up being an hour. Why? People sing Jesus on the main line. Only got two stanzas. But, but they'll sing it for 25 minutes. How can you sing one song for 25 minutes with two stanzas? It's because in the middle of that song, you remember the pain that you went through. You remember how you got healed from that pain. There's a lot more things that can happen in our own cultural strengths that we can embrace. And yes, I do think the world is crazy. But if I wait for the crazy world to get healthy before I take care of my kids, I'm crazy. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I appreciate what everybody's saying here. I'm feeling empowered by, by the, the words that you all are saying. Um, but it is a fight. It's not like being nice and cute. We have to fight for our voice. We have to fight for our children's voice. Um, so, anyway, thank you for Thank and I address too with this young 71 year old lady said <laughs> you and I may get up a little bit off. I'm trying to check my time to make sure I don't get too far off. But you made a, a really strong comment about reaching out to the community. And in my experience, I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell from from my experience, you have a legitimate concern there. Because what I've seen is that you have, and I'm speaking just for faculty members who want to go into the community. The issue is this catch 22, is that colleagues sometimes don't value that. And what I mean for, fac for faculty that are tenure earning, you have to get a number of things, publications, you have to get grants. And when you have colleagues that, I won't say undermine, but devalue that and say things such as, you know, I don't see, expertise in that or, 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 or that's not expertise to me, it nullifies an individual's ability, won't say ability, but desire to go in there. Because one thing, you want your job, you want to get tenure, you want to do the things that can make you and your family successful. But when you have, for this lack of a better term, white supremacy, and white supremacy doesn't mean somebody with the KKK, it can be, I think you said something about like silent, like silent, no, Taylor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That, that that also helps to nullify because you're just promulgating this idea of like, well, this doesn't mean anything to me, so it shouldn't mean anything to you. And so I think you have a legitimate point, and I and I, I I'm I'm with you. Share numbers, share information because that's something that needs to be done and, and speaking to this gentleman's point about how do we go from you know deficit to strength based there's strength based in you know the elders i just talked to my wife about that recently how in this kind of culture that we have the elders are denigrated where you go to other cultures and i just keep bringing this up like a bad you know habit here but Afrocentric, we look at the elders as having prominence, of having the, the wisdom that we can grow and, and utilize and then develop from that. And so to make a long story short, I just think you have a very legitimate point and it is something that we are trying to take away, but it's just like putting together a house. It's brick by brick and you need a number of different laborers to get this to happen. We're a group of uh, seniors, New York State senior advocacy, and we are working on it. So I would like to talk to whoever's interested. And I have cousins that are going here to your law school, and there's some things we want to work with your school, maybe the little students, the lawyers. Thank you. Real quick, I know we have another Real comment. Quick, I know, uh, no, I just wanted to add on, you know, this conversation of that you brought up about you know being in an academic environment and looking at the systemic racism and actually studying it as a you know for research right and i think that 
part of an issue here, though, is, is that you know this structure and system of publishing and doing research is not really favorable to work um, that focuses on essentially something that is specifically affecting one group of people, right? Um, and then asking the question of how do you measure, right? How do you measure racism and how do you measure the sustainment of racism? And I think that that again is work that can be done um, for those of us who are in this academic setting to figure that out, right? Like there's emotions that are used to measure things that some would say are not really measurable, but they've found systems and ways to be able to actually use tools to say that, you know, this is how much somebody has empathy versus somebody doesn't, right? This is person is nice versus somebody is not, whereas to me, I'm nice is a place in France, right? Um, so I think that um, being able to change that narrative and, and put money in actually studying the systemic factors that are affecting um, people of color that are usually translated as social um, and economic um, disadvantages, but that's actually not the, the, not the case. Um, just, just real quick about the community aspect. I know in the Graduate School of Education, um, that is one of our mission. Um, I know um, our dean and our leadership hired, um, you know, someone to help us get in touch with the community. And I do believe that last meeting I went to that um, those considerations will be be made um, as junior faculty go off for tenure and everything like that. So you should hear a lot of good stuff from the Graduate School of Education and connections to communities. Um, we have a question online and then we'll have another question in person. Um, in terms of school systems, how do we prepare in New York for policies similar to Texas and Florida that remove DEI personnel and prevent racial discussions in schools? We guard for battle because we're not going to tolerate what they're doing in Texas and Florida. This is New York. I think is it critically important for us to be aware of whatever foolishness is going on somewhere else because um, um, the, um, the German pastor, Martin Niemöller, um, told us all that if you wait and do nothing, they will come for you. So we simply need to gird for battle. Let's get ready because um, we saw a critically important um, circumstance in our politics in New York um, in that um, the state budget which is controlled by three portions of our government, all who are from the same party and couldn't figure it out on time on April 1st, and it took to May 3rd, we need to be ready. Let's not sleep this because um, it will take one election cycle to put those powers back in the hands of people who have no concern or interest and your interests and your concerns. And so it becomes critically important for us, gird for battle. And that may sound like a strange thing coming from a pastor as a disciple of, of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. But I'm telling you right now, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. And so as a soldier, you must be ready for battle. You must be astutely aware of what's going on around you and be prepared so that when it comes, you are not caught asleep without weaponry and without preparation. Because my grandfather used to tell me as a child, and he went to a one-room schoolhouse in Georgia, but he said, the failure to prepare is preparing to fail. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so if we're not ready, shame on us. Because we know that they're the same kind of people who operate in our government right here in New York. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that our voices are heard, that we are exercising our powers, and they are many. But primarily, um, we've got an election coming up in a few weeks. Is everybody here registered to vote? Is everybody here going to vote? Not talk about it. Get yourself up. The polls open at 6 a.m. They close at 9. You have 15 hours. Get to the polls 
and vote. I don't really have a discussion for you about who to vote for. I'm telling you vote because those are the tools that we are going to need. And those are the tools that frighten people most is that you are socially aware and active, yeah. socially, politically, and every other way that you need to be active. So let's be ready. All right, so we are, we're at the point of the symposium where we're gonna do lightning round, okay? All right, so we can ask quick questions, quick answers, uh, because I have two questions here and I have a question online. So let's start here and then we'll go here and then we'll finish off with the online question. Okay. We have another question in the middle. Yeah, there's a doctor oh, right. there been one asked. Yeah, he's been having his hand up as well. Okay, all right, great. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, what do I want first? Okay. May not be a lightning uh, answer, but um, we talked about faith communities. How can we leverage them? There's a lot of disturbing trends. The percentage of people that go to church, synagogues, and other faith communities is decreasing. The younger generation seems to have their religion as TikTok, but I think it plays a crucial role in reducing stress, reducing hatred, teaching respect of your parents and others, loving thy neighbor. How do we reverse that trend and use these faith communities as we battle up, as you said, being a soldier for the Lord? Well, um, I think we we begun to do that in the Jacob School and in the Community Health Equity Research Institute. And we are now, again, doing that with the Graduate School of Education in the Buffalo Education Equity Task Force. We just simply have to go where people are willing to ally with us to shoulder and work alongside of us and work with those people. And what we do when we do that is we empower each other mm -hmm. to a better outcome. And then we, we do a demonstration project for others to see. And then they say, you know, there are aha moments. Um, if you all remember Arsenio Hall, <laughs> I'm not dating myself, but you know, you know, those are things that should make you go, hmm. Mm -hmm. Could I also throw in that your ability to fight is related to your mental health. And your ability to fight is related to your children watching you fight and their mental health. So um, I don't want to underestimate that, but your knowledge of history is essential for you to be prepared for that fight. If you don't know the history of what has happened, you don't know what you're really fighting for. So when somebody decides to take out history and books from school, it is a major violence because, you're, because it means your child can't dream within the reality of what's happening in the world. They can't, they can't know how to fight. Can I uh, um, uh, also, I know I have to be quick, but you, but you talked about something really important and in clinical mental health counseling, we think of something as symptoms and then the meaning. The symptoms are that people are going to, to TikTok and they're not maybe going to organize religion. What's the rationale behind that? You know, I mean, we, if we dig deeper, we, we can look at how you know, media, political figures back certain individuals that don't have Christian principles, but rally so adamantly behind them. And that, for a lot of young people, takes them away from that because they see hypocrisy. Right. And so, I mean, like your question really is a deep one, but I would just say looking at the symptoms is not going to, I mean, you're a doctor. Well, I would assume you dress like a doctor. So I, <laughs> I assume that you, know, you might not be sometimes assumptions. <laughs> But, uh, but but having that understanding of symptoms as opposed to the meaning or cause of it is going to be quite fundamental. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Stevenson. I know that there were theories and um, not theories, but framework shared today. And as a social worker who's been working in the community with people who were impacted by the May 14th shooting, I am seeing things like people developing skin conditions, losing their mm -hmm. hair, people experiencing mm -hmm. homelessness because yeah. they can't yeah. get to work and function properly at work due to the trauma they experience. How do we as a community begin to heal when Buffalo is highly segregated and a very racist 
city. And I'm pretty sure that many of the black people who are in this room that live in Buffalo understand they're very acutely aware of where they cannot go and where they are not welcome. And so how do we navigate a city that is very segregated, has high concentrations of poverty, um, one supermarket located in the black community that many people are still very afraid to go to just because mm -hmm. of the energy um, and everything that took place there. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any healing. I don't think there's no healing from this. I think once again, African Americans have been subjected to this experience in this country. Um, you know, they keep talking about post-traumatic. It's not post. This is current, right? African Americans just go through this on a daily basis, current. Um, so what we've done throughout history is that we kept pushing, right? We never had a chance. African Americans have never had a chance in this country to get together and heal from slavery, from the trauma of slavery. We just had to keep on going. It still hasn't been addressed, right? We still talk about it. We're still trying to bring it up. It's still, it's still, it's, it's still a reluctance to address it, to deal with those, those, the root of the problem. And so what have we done? We kept moving. We have kept going under the guise of this trauma, which, you know, which leads to post-traumatic slave syndrome and Joy DeBru and all of that, and this trauma that we, you know, that, that we continue mm -hmm. to carry um, and try to shield our children from it as much as we can, which, which, which we fail a lot of the times, they end up being traumatized as well, right? So, um, what I'm saying is, you know, that the legacy of black people in this country has been to press on with that foot on our neck and to keep getting up and to not quit and to not quit and to maintain, to have this, you know, to, main, to, to have this optimism that this country will change and look at us differently, right? But now nah, there ain't no healing. There is no healing. <laughs> there is no, and every time I, I find out another piece of history that I didn't know about, the wound opens back up again, right? The more when we talk about this history, this is what this history does. It 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 opens up the wound, but it empowers you. This is why we need this idea that they call wokeness. All it is is being socially aware. Mm -hmm. And having historical context to understand why things are the way that they are. So black people, we continue to do that. We share those stories. We share the common experiences. Right? Um, we have to, so that we can make sense of all of this. It's 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 it's, it's resiliency, it's 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 an, it's, it's, a, it's a protective factor. And then we keep going. But you know, let it be, we are not healing. This just opened up more wounds that 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 you know supposedly this post racial era claim to this band aid of this post racial. Nah, it, it's never been post racial. We continue to feel it. We continue to be oppressed. Our we continue to fear for our children. And then we have to and we have to continue to figure out a way to navigate. It's true through this through this ridiculous <laughs> this ridiculous terrain. It, <laughs> It raises the question of, can you be healed? Do you believe in healing or not? Because sometimes people don't get back up, right? That's right. And I think there was a difference between getting knocked upside the head again, but not talking about it. Sometimes the only thing we had was a story. If people come to you as a social worker, sometimes, or to me as a therapist, sometimes it's just me listening. Tell me what happened to you. Now, I think that is not total healing, but I do think it allows me to get up. It allows some people to get back up. And get back up is no small thing, man. It's not a small thing. Now, do I want to wait until the systems get healthy enough to know the history? Man, how long have we been waiting? How long? Too long. And I still pray for that. My brother fights for that. But I got to have, in the middle of the crisis, some healing. Preacher knows about this. There has to be a both and possibility. Because some do not get back up. And, and the reality is, your stories matter. 
the horror of your stories matter too, but you're still being here to tell that story matters too. So I agree with you and I disagree with you because I wouldn't be here if somebody didn't share that story with me. Testimony service is funny. Sometimes people tell a story and they repeat the same story every week. I remember I could repeat what some other people in my church, they would tell the same story. But some people will come and they tell a different story every week about what happened to me on my job, right? The brothers in the, in the, in the barbershop won't tell their partner, won't tell a pastor, but in the barbershop, they tell everybody everything. That story matters. Is it full healing? I don't think so. I agree with you. But brother, I mean, there's some people who don't get up. And I don't know. That, that's what ancestors have for us. You done been through some stuff. Don't keep it to yourself. Anyway, I'm sorry. I so, believe in what you're saying. So uh, we are at time. Uh, but I do believe uh, we have space to have a, another event on another date on um, maybe something focusing on where do we go from here, right? More action steps, right? Um, so we'll probably be talking about that a little bit later, but I do want to um, respect everyone's time and I want to thank everyone from coming. And I want to thank everyone online who submitted questions and we're going to try to um, have some written um, responses for you all. Um, but if there's nothing else, we're good. You want to say something, Suzanne? Are you good? All right. All right. Uh, thank you for coming out and uh, see you next time.